My name is Michael Umbrello. Uh, tough person to follow with Dr. Ba uh, Vostert. Uh, it's always interesting to get to speak about uh, diseases and things we know about with other experts to see similarities and differences in the way that we uh, kind of interpret the data. Um, as I'm talking today, I'm going to talk about the genetics component of the uh, genetics and overlap with autoinflammatory disease of systemic arthritis or Stills disease. The first thing I want to talk about is the phenotypic heterogeneity of systemic JIA. Um, Boss alluded to that in his talk, and I think this is a critical point because if you even start with the natural history or the disease course prior to uh, effective treatments, systemic arthritis can be divided into three very distinct disease courses. One is a monophasic disease where the patients have an episode of inflammation that begins. They progress through the episode of inflammation, and through whatever means that episode is aborted, it stops. At that time, they no longer have inflammation. They're off of therapy, and they continue to remain without symptoms, and they don't develop another episode. That's one disease course. The second is the polycyclic disease course, which looks a lot like the monophasic course, except for at some point during that disease-free period, they develop another episode and maybe another and another. That's the polycyclic course. And then the third is the persistent course. These are people who start with their inflammation, they receive treatment, and their inflammation may start to improve, but they can never be taken off of medications because they have inflammation that persists under the surface. So they have persistent inflammation. These are three distinct patterns of inflammation that are within the, the confines of what we call a single entity or condition, systemic JIA. And this is the crux of the problem from my perspective. Going beyond the disease course, you have complications that happen predictably in subsets of patients that might be genetically prescribed, like macrophage activation syndrome. And I'm not going to talk about the genes, but there are good studies that show that genes that cause primary HLH also influence secondary HLH in systemic JIA. I think Drs. Grom and uh, uh, D. Benedetti are going to talk about that briefly. There's also chronic arthritis that occurs in up to half of patients. There's a new developing uh, feature that's been noticed in the past 10 years, a very bad interstitial lung disease, which I won't talk about it. Uh, in detail. But again, there's a series of complications that are occurring, and these are defining different groups of the systemic arthritis patients. And then finally, there's pretty clearly different populations with res respect to therapeutic responses. Some patients respond to IL-1 blockade beautifully. Other patients respond to IL-6 blockade beautifully. A small number respond to TNF-alpha blockade. And there are some who respond to nothing. If you look at the, the studies from several of the the big groups that have been longitudinally using these biologic agents, they have an average of 40 to 50 percent of patients after five years who still are not able to have their disease controlled by the currently available treatments, anakinumab, tocilizumab, um, rolonicept. So this heterogeneity of disease is a big problem. It's a big problem in terms of thinking about the disease, but it's a big problem in thinking about how we can use genetic studies to look at this disease. So what I wonder is whether we can use genetic tools to try to tease this disease or this condition apart into its constitutive, constituent molecular components. So in terms of systemic JIA, we'll call it a genetically complex trait, because if you look at this condition as a whole, it's not generally inherited in families in a Mendelian fashion. There are rare cases where there's familial clustering or where there's inheritance, and that can be the case in many polygenic diseases, where there's a, a monogenic form thrust of a, a complex disease. But generally speaking, we think of it as polygenic and inheritance. We think that there are environmental components, with many people spending time looking at viral infections. And we think that it's quite possible that de novo mutations or somatic mutations could explain the lack of familial inheritance that we've observed. When we think about genetically complex diseases or the, cont the contribution of variants to disease, we need to think about variants with respect to both the frequency of the variants in the population, which is on the x-axis, and the effect of the variant, which is on the y-axis. You have common variants, which will have relatively small effect on disease risk. To identify the, the effect of these variants, you need to study populations, large groups of people. On the other end of the spectrum, you have very high effect variants, where having a single mutation or two mutations in that gene could cause a disease. These are Mendelian variants. We would find these generally by sequencing of patients. And then a combination of sequencing individuals and population-based studies can find these kind of intermediate low-frequency variants that can have intermediate effect sizes. So we need to think about how to find all of these kind of variants in a condition where the phenotype is unclear and we're wondering whether it may actually be a syndrome instead of a disease. And so how do we, gen how do we investigate genetically complex traits? So the first way that we can do it is on the population level with an association study. This is essentially where we look at the frequency of a genetic marker or any particular variable in a group of people who are affected. 
and a group of people who are ancestrally the same, drawn from the same population, who aren't affected. And you see things that happen more commonly or less commonly in the people with disease. So that's the association study. You can also look at families where there's Mendelian inheritance, and you can use traditional linkage analysis or sequencing methods to identify causative mutations. You can also look within trios, so an affected child with two unaffected parents, in an effort to try to find mutations that developed during that child's embryogenesis uh, that the parents don't carry. Uh, You can also take multiple trios with the same phenotype and put them together to identify things that they may share that might not otherwise risen to the level of attention. And finally, if you have a population of people in whom you're sequencing, you can look at the phenotypic extremes. You can find the group of people with the most severe disease and compare those people to healthy subjects or to the people with the least severe disease. Critical to all of these genetic approaches is that we maximize the sample size to improve the statistical power and at the same time that we very carefully phenotype, because putting multiple phenotypes into a genetic study can yield zero results. Sometimes it might yield an average result, and if the effect is large enough, you can still see it through the noise, but it's possible that putting different phenotypes together will yield no result. So before the age of genomics in systemic juvenile arthritis, the genetic studies of systemic JIA looked at collections of patients up to, you know, 250 cases. Many of these were from single uh, centers, although some of them were uh, combinatorial studies between multiple centers. Um, And there were tantalizing genes that were identified and implicated in systemic arthritis, inflammatory genes like the IL-1 and IL-6 families, the anti-inflammatory IL-10 family, the IL-1 receptor family. I won't read them all to you, but these were tantalizing. They were interesting, and they were hot at the time. But when the studies were done, the majority of them had both positive studies reporting association and negative studies not reporting association. This was probably due to undetectable effects of differences between the case and control populations uh, in in either the positive or the negative studies. Um, And so as we moved to the genomics era, we had the opportunity to repeat these sorts of studies while using the genomic information to correct for those sorts of biases. So the first thing we did to move into the genomics era was try to find collaborators from around the world who were interested in the same thing. So working with leaders in the field, several of whom are in the room with us today, we were able to assemble an international collection of almost 1,000 children with systemic arthritis and 8,000 controls. These were drawn from nine different countries, and so we performed our analysis uh, on the nine different groups independently so as to not bias the results, and then we meta-analyzed those groups. And we have a series of studies and results that we've observed from this population. The first thing that we found when we studied this population was unexpected. We found that the strongest association with systemic juvenile arthritis was within the major histocompatibility complex locus on chromosome 6, specifically the class 2 region. So this encodes the proteins that present antigens to T cells, specifically CD4 helper T cells. And this points towards the adaptive immune system. Specifically, we found a haplotype that was about 200 kilobases long that contained many of the important MHC class 2 genes. And this thing was associated with systemic arthritis, increasing the risk of developing arthritis by about 2.3-fold for people who had that allele. Um, That's pretty significant and was observed in eight of the nine populations that we studied independent of one another. The reason this was striking again is because systemic arthritis is inflammatory, and it looks like it's a disease of innate immune activation. But this pretty clearly is identifying at least adaptive immune machinery which could suggest autoimmunity in addition to autoinflammation. Beyond the MHC locus, we identified other associations across the genome in this genome-wide association study. For the sake of brevity, I'll just point out a few things. We identified 23 novel risk loci, including a locus near a long non-coding RNA on chromosome 1 that's never been reported to be associated with the disease before. We identified several targets that are immediately druggable with therapeutics that are in the FDA pipeline. And finally, taking the entire genomic information from systemic arthritis and comparing it to the other forms of juvenile idiopathic arthritis for which similar data were available, we were able to demonstrate very clearly that the genetic architecture or the genetic underpinnings of systemic arthritis differ from those of the other types of juvenile idiopathic arthritis. This is important because of something that Boss talked about earlier, which is the revising of the juvenile idiopathic arthritis classification criteria. One could make the argument that these data advocate for systemic juvenile idiopathic arthritis being considered separate from the JIA group 
both to help physicians who care for this disease to change the way they conceive of this, as well as to help uh, people who are looking for new treatments for this disease. Because in the end, the treatments for juvenile idiopathic arthritis are not in the same ballpark. Maybe the treatments for autoinflammatory diseases are the ones that we should be thinking about. So if we move it from juvenile arthritis, that may be beneficial. We then used the GWAS data set to go back and look at that list of candidate genes because uh, the literature were unclear at the time. And when we did so, we found that 11 of the 12 loci did not have association. The one that did have association is the one I'm showing you here, which is the IL-1-RN locus, encoding the anti-inflammatory IL-1 receptor antagonist. The associated SNPs were in the promoter region of IL-1-RN, and they were strong expression QTLs, or they correlated strongly with the expression of IL-1-RN in a number of different cell types, as well as uh, IL-1 receptor antagonist serum levels, the protein in the serum. Low expression of the alleles, either in the blood or in the, the, the cells, was correlated as a risk factor for systemic JIA. So if they have a low amount of the anti-inflammatory chemical, it's a risk factor for developing disease. And more interestingly, the protein that's encoded by this gene locus is available as a therapeutic called anakinra. It's the IL-1 receptor antagonist, and it's effective in many cases in Boss's cohort for most of the patients that he treats for systemic JIA. So the question was whether differences in basal expression of that protein affect whether a person could be predicted to respond to that treatment. So in this pilot study that we did, we found that people who had two copies of the high-expressing allele, the high-expressing variant, actually didn't respond and were very highly predicted to not respond to this treatment. Uh, We looked in a single population, so at this point it's necessary for this to be replicated in other populations, but this holds promise of being able to identify genetic variants that can help us to guide treatment for an individual to the best treatment for that person. So beyond the population-based studies, uh, there have been, and in this particular case, this is uh, five multiplex families. Uh, There was a study of five multiplex families, consanguineous families from Saudi Arabia, uh, who had a phenotype that was described as systemic juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Within these families, there were 13 affected children, and all of them were, were reported to have symmetrical erosive polyarthritis daily spiking fever, and maculopapular rash. The additional information that was provided included that there was a preponderance of females, 12 out of 13, together with nine of those 13 having persistent features, two of them having organomegaly and sericitis, and eight of them with a positive antinuclear antibody. So when I look at this, they fulfill the ILR criteria, but there's a few things that look different to me. The preponderance of females, there's an even male-to-female distribution of systemic arthritis in the general population. The persistent features in 9 out of 13, that's a minority contribution. It's probably the second most frequent of the the three. Uh, It's debatable because there's not good epi studies, but 9 out of 13 is many more persistent patients than one would expect. And 8 ANA positive out of 13 is also more than one would expect. The point I'm making is not that these patients aren't sick or that they don't have you know, a disease, but it's that they have a specific flavor of what this classification criteria is bundling together. It's it's a specific thing. And in fact, it is a specific thing because uh, they used a series of linkage studies followed by sequencing and sequencing to identify uh, recessive mutations in the LAC1 gene, now called famine. So famine is the new name for this gene locus. It's the fatty acid metabolism immune nexus. And the importance of this is that it regulates fatty acid synthesis, But that's critical because fatty acid synthesis is an essential switch between M1 pro-inflammatory and M2 anti-inflammatory macrophages. And so the mutations that cause this impair the energetic reserves of the macrophages, which dysregulates their differentiation. Recent studies have also shown that famine uh, associates physically with NOD2 and is is responsible for regulating innate immune activation and signaling. Um, There's a monkey wrench in this story And that's that this exact mutation was previously reported in a consanguineous Saudi Arabian family to be the cause of very early onset Crohn disease in an infant. The exact same mutation. And then subsequently, multiple different loss of function frame shift mutations in this gene have been identified in other children with different forms of juvenile arthritis that don't seem to have the inflammatory character. So in a certain way, the jury is out about what this means. It's a very interesting phenotype, but it's not clear what it means. And so getting back to this idea about systemic JIA as a syndrome or a disease. So I'm showing you a group of, uh, a cluster of grapes because that's how I think about systemic arthritis. 
And I've put the autoinflammatory disease genes on here because if we go back in time, before we knew about these autoinflammatory diseases, many of these kids were probably thrown into the bin of systemic arthritis. They have systemic juvenile rheumatoid arthritis or systemic juvenile chronic arthritis. And then as the genes were identified, they were pulled out, right? These people have FMF. Now, some of these, the genetic pattern probably suggested it was a different disease. But in the end, they were part of this garbage can, right? And so my question is whether LAC1 and famine actually at this point could also be removed from systemic JIA and be called as something else, its own autoinflammatory disease. And this gets also back to the idiopathic term, because systemic juvenile idiopathic arthritis means we don't know why they have this. And as soon as you know the mutation that's causing it, it's no longer that. The other question I have is if this is a cluster of grapes and we can pick off monogenic forms, will there still be a cluster of grapes remaining? Or is what remains going to be something more like an apple or a sphere that is then the polygenic core with the monogenic form frosts around it? This is a philosophical question, but trying to think of how we conceive of this group of entities, right? So if we think about juvenile idiopathic arthritis for a minute, this is the ILR criteria and the seven different classifications. But if we think about genetic data and what the genetic data tells us, it actually tells us that you've got several of the groups that have an intersection of their pathophysiology. You have several other groups that intersect, and then the childhood onset rheumatoid arthritis seems to share some pathophysiology as well. But you have systemic arthritis completely separate. And I would argue that it's this. It's not one thing. It's multiple things. So should we think about the genes that cause the phenotypes that are similar to this, the autoinflammatory disease genes? And so I'll just share with you in the last couple of minutes some unpublished data that we're in the process of looking at right now. Um, So familial Mediterranean fever uh, has significant overlap with systemic JIA with respect to the fever and the arthritis and the serositis and the skin rash, as does FCAS, as does HIDS, as does TRAPS. And they all respond to IL-1 blockade reasonably well. So to ask this question, we took 525 Northern European uh, children with systemic juvenile arthritis from the in-charge cohort, and we sequenced six genes that are known to cause monogenic autoinflammation. We analyzed these quantitatively using statistical analyses by looking at the common variants for associations between the systemic JIA cohort and the exact non-Finnish European reference cohort, which is a very big population that has pretty solid allele frequencies. With respect to common variants, like the functional polymorphisms that we talk about all the time, there was no association between the functional polymorphisms and systemic JIA. However, when we did rare variant association testing using tests that are specifically designed to find the effects of these rare variants in populations, we found that the rare variants of MEFV and the rare variants of NOD2 influence systemic JIA risk. They were significantly associated, as was the group of these six genes when put together and called autoinflammatory disease genes. They were also significantly associated with systemic JIA. We also did a qualitative analysis where we looked at what were the mutations we found or what kind of mutations did we find. And first of all, we saw that there were three cases of monogenic autoinflammation in our cohort, which I don't think is an indication of a mistake or a problem by our colleague, but rather the significant overlap between these these entities. Um, And then second of all, we found several novel or recurrent mutations in these these autoinflammatory disease genes that are of great interest and that we're trying to investigate further. So I think that these preliminary data that I share with you suggest that despite the fact that the autoinflammatory disease causing mutations don't seem to be operative in systemic arthritis, other variants within those genes do seem to be operative in the pathophysiology of systemic JIA. So to summarize kind of the overarching findings of genomics to date, it's pretty clear that there are genetic factors that that influence the susceptibility of at least some systemic arthritis patients. Maybe if the phenotype was more pure, these effects would even be more significant if we could remove the people that had something different or could make more constant phenotype. Second, it seems like despite its inflammatory and innate immune character, autoimmunity could be or might be involved in systemic JIA. Uh, and studies are currently underway to try to better understand this. Third, systemic JIA is different than the other types of childhood arthritis, and we have to keep that in mind both as we uh, evaluate these patients and think about future treatments. And in truth, there are likely many causes for systemic JIA as we think about different phenotypic subsets, responders to IL-1, those with autoantibodies. Oh, I didn't mention that. The HLA association patients seem to have autoantibodies more frequently, which is kind of a pathogenicity phenotype correlation. And then 
you know, I alluded to this, but I'm just envisioning whether there could be a genotype-phenotype connection here. We pointed out that persistent arthritis uh, was very prominent in, the, in those patients with the famine mutations. I mentioned the ANA positivity just now with the HLA-DRB111 alleles. We know that the HLH genes predispose to macrophage activation syndrome, and IO1RN variants seem to predict response or non-response to anakinra. So as we look forward for how to move genomics and genetics of systemic JIA into the future, I think we have to expand our sequencing efforts and prioritize the phenotypic extremes. I think that that's where we'll get the most bang for our buck in the short term, and then in the long term, putting together the biggest possible collection of individuals to compare is critical. I think we have to integrate our genomic data with the immunophenotypic data of the type that Boss has shown us, and I mean, that's amazing data. I would love to do an integrated analysis of these data with genomics and transcriptomics. Uh, I think we need to try to study pure subpopulations within the phenotype. And I think adult onset stills disease and comparative studies with systemic JIA will be very fruitful because I think that they, if not a spectrum, uh, it may even be the same entity. Um, there are so many people to acknowledge and probably can't even read them all, but I have collaborators from around the world as well as many collaborators here at the NIH, and none of what I've shown you from our lab would have been possible without them. I thank you all for your attention. <laughs>